I was gonna be talking mostly about things like DLSS being confirmed for the Switch by Nintendo. There was a lot of speculation about that. Uh, new AMD GPU, 9070GRE, and we will talk about those things, but yesterday we had massive news uh, with the White House uh, announcing reciprocal tariffs on a lot of countries and by a large percentage on specific ones. And that leads to headlines like this, claiming that PCs, servers, and smartphones are about to get pricier by about 40%. What's going on with all of that? Uh, I do need to be absolutely clear that my channel discusses this only in the context of how it affects computer pricing and especially graphics cards. This channel is not intended to be a political channel, so I'm not gonna talk about things like what I feel are the economic pros or cons or anything about this policy. That is not the intention of this channel. However, I do think it's important to note that certain countries uh, like Taiwan that produce the semiconductors, the chips inside of the GPUs, and countries where a lot of the actual GPU cards themselves get manufactured. Sometimes that's Taiwan, sometimes it's China. Uh, some places, like I think uh, PNY, for example, had been avoiding a lot of tariffs so far because I think their production of their cards is mostly in Vietnam, if I'm remembering correctly. Well, Vietnam's now getting a 46% tariff. So it is very, very likely that prices on things like graphics cards and PC components in general are about to go way up rather than coming back down to earth if this all has the intended effect. Again, the general idea of a tariff is that as a uh, this is a tax paid on the import of the product into the United States. So if the product is coming from one of these places, and uh, again, it looks like most of the places that, that generally produce these things um, have some pretty large percentage tariffs on it, then the importing business uh, pays that, which means that if they then sold at their normal pricing, that would massively eat into or erase their profit margins. So to maintain margins, the idea is then they would raise pricing. So I'm just saying it looks like pricing is not likely to improve anytime soon, at least in the United States. Now, how does this affect the rest of the world? Well, these are tariffs um, in, on imports into the United States. That being said, if you look at what generally happens with this kind of situation, it does seem like prices go up elsewhere as well. So this is likely to hurt pricing in a lot of places besides the United States, although officially the tariff itself is just on imports into the US. Whew, okay, that was a lot. Now, anyway, uh, is it possible we'll get some other GPU models that are more affordable and things like that? Well, the latest rumor in the GPU mill is that AMD is preparing an RX 9070 GRE. Remember, GRE used to stand for Golden Rabbit Edition and be Chinese exclusive products. However, they have been renamed the Great Radeon Edition since we're no longer in the year of the rabbit. And sometimes these products do end up making it to the United States, although not always. For example, the 7900 GRE did end up getting a worldwide release after initially being a China exclusive. Now, I initially found this reported by videocards.com, but it seems like their source for the information was IT Home, which I'm showing you here. And again, all my sources today will be linked in the video description. And I'm translating this using uh, Google's built-in translator since this is not an English language article. So they're claiming that AMD will launch Radeon 9070GRE graphics card and is ready to enter mass production and that this is um, uh, in a planning stage with AIB partners and uh, again, soon to enter mass production. The interesting thing here is that they're calling this a 12 gigabyte card. Now that's really interesting again, because right now the 9070 and 9070 XT are both 16 gigabyte graphics cards, which is really good. But then the rumor is that the next step down will be a 9060 which would then uh, have like an eight gigabyte and uh, maybe 16 gigabyte in clamshell mode, but it would be nice to kind of have something in between. So I do like the idea of having a 12 gigabyte card uh, in between the uh, 9060 series cards and the 9070 and 9070 XT cards. So that's pretty interesting, but again, this is not official information at this point. Uh, so we'll have to see what comes of it. And right now they're not claiming to know anything about the specific specs or anything like that. So the 12 gigabytes seems to be the, um, uh, the most info we have on that. Uh, now the other real big news happening yesterday was the Switch 2. Now in 
uh, Nintendo's official announcement, we got all sorts of information. But what a lot of people, who especially were in more of the PC space, were wondering is with NVIDIA hardware inside, is this gonna support DLSS? And Nintendo did not make any mention to DLSS, and people doing analysis on the footage of the game trailers that they showed, like Digital Foundry, uh, did not see any evidence of DLSS being used. The type of image quality and anti-aliasing that we were seeing did not seem to indicate DLSS was in use by any of those kind of visual characteristics. But IGN was able to get a direct quote from Nintendo on this topic. Uh, so the direct quote, and again, all my sources will be in the video description, is this. Um, so they say, we use DLSS upscaling technology, and that's something that we need to use as we develop games. And when it comes to hardware, it is able to output to a TV at a max of 4K, whether the software developer is going to use that as a native resolution or get it to upscale is something that the software developer can choose. I think it opens up a lot of options for the software developer to choose from. So again, it's uh, kind of vague on if any of the games that they actually showed are specifically using DLSS at this point, but it is very clear that they are saying that that option is available. However, what remains to be seen is whether it's actually worth using on Nintendo Switch 2 hardware, uh, because uh, upscaling has its own performance cost. So if you upscale from say 1080p to 4K, there's actually quite a bit of performance cost, uh, frame time cost involved in that. So if you're trying to then get that into like a 60 FPS uh, output or something like that, it's possible that the frame time cost from the upscale just isn't worth it. However, it is, uh, you know, you can set different scale factors. So maybe you upscale from 720p to 1440p and then just output that to a 4K display using more of just the display upscaler or a spatial upscaler. There's a lot of options for how this could go. But anyway, it is confirmed that the Nintendo Switch 2 has DLSS capability. So, so Nintendo is allowing that, but again, they're leaving it up to software developers to choose what they want to do with that. Again, um, image quality analysis on the games shown did not seem to be indicating DLSS usage um, on that. And also I've seen some comments asking, what about the new transformer model and all of that? Well, they don't mention that, but remember that the actual hardware is, uh, seems to be Ampere based and Ampere doesn't run the new transformer model, model as fast as it runs the older CNN models. So I would be pretty doubtful of them using the transformer model, but again, they're not being specific on that. Now, that being said, it does seem to be the case that some games might actually run at a native 4K60 on the Switch 2, but this is likely going to be games that were designed around the Switch 1 and then are able to boost the performance uh, and or resolution by running on the more powerful hardware. We're seeing games like Metroid Prime 4 um, claiming 4K60 FPS with HDR, and in handheld mode running at 1080p 60 with HDR, but also offering a performance mode of 1080p 120 FPS in HDR or in handheld mode 720p 120 FPS HDR. So that all sounds pretty cool. Uh, the general hardware specs uh, that are most important is they did just say it's an NVIDIA processor. They didn't confirm all of the leaked details on that, but it does seem to be the case that all of the leaked details seem to be accurate. But the display was confirmed to be a 120 hertz 1080p display, and I believe I saw confirmation of variable refresh rate support, which is really nice. Because honestly, uh, for handhelds, I use the Steam Deck a lot, and my main gripe about it is the lack of uh, a variable refresh rate support. So I think that's pretty cool. And again, even though it's not an OLED screen, it does have an HDR mode. Now for me personally, deciding whether to buy the launch version, that's my main holdup is I'm like, oh man, if I wait, there's probably gonna be an OLED update and I'd rather have that. At the same time though, all signs point to the uh, LCD display being significantly better than the original LCD display on the original Switch. Because I got the original Switch, and I've got to say, the built-in display is very poor quality. Um, the, the colors don't look great. It, it's not good. Um, whereas a decent LCD with HDR support, 120 hertz, variable refresh rate, uh, that could end up looking pretty good. 
Again, it can output up to 4K60. However, it does not necessarily mean games will usually be running at that resolution. Like I said, I think maybe Switch 1 games might be able to run like that, but um, games developed specifically for the Switch 2, you know, some of them might target that. That's their choice, but we'll have to see. 256 gigabyte storage with a micro SD Express expansion. So uh, the slower micro SD cards uh, that were compatible with the original Switch, I don't think are compatible here, at least not for installing games and things like that. Uh, it looks like it has Wi-Fi 6, dual USB type C, game card and micro SD Express slot, a uh, 5220 uh, milliamp hour, uh, uh, right? Is that, is, that, is that right? Oh, whatever. Anyway, uh, battery <laughs> release date, uh, June 5th, 2025, and the price is $449. Additionally, talking about pricing, um, there's been some discussion of game pricing that came out of this because they are announcing that Mario Kart World is going to have an $80 price tag. Now, that's led to a lot of things like this, which is talking about... Um, is it fair for game prices to go up due to inflation? And I have a lot of thoughts about this. So I found this posted on Reddit uh, showing inflation adjusted Mario Kart pricing over the years and actually showing that if you account for inflation, the pricing does seem to make sense. But the question is, is it fair to in adjust game pricing with inflation? Now. Um, I think one reason why game pricing generally hasn't gone up with inflation is if your install base is growing, if you can sell more copies, then you don't necessarily need to raise prices on games to increase or maintain profits on games, right? Because if you sell more copies, uh, then, then you don't necessarily have to make more money on each copy to have growth, right? Now, if the games market stops growing, and inflation goes up, and if the development budgets for games go up, then I think that's where you start to run into the issue. So there are some signs of at least certain parts of the game market maybe not growing as rapidly as it used to, in which case, I don't know, are we gonna have to start seeing game prices increase? Because the problem then is if they increase to a point where the market won't bear it, because okay, are uh, wages increasing with inflation? And even if they are, um, or even if they're outpacing it, what about other necess necessities? Because in the end, games are, are, are they're, they're not mandatory, right? You have to pay your rent, you have to buy gas, you have to have your car, you have to have transportation, you have to have groceries. There's a lot of things that the prices have gone up on. And if that's reducing your spending money left over after all of that's gone, then certain entertainment items like games you might just not be able to buy as many of them if their prices go up. So I think this is something where the entertainment industry, the gaming industry, is gonna really have to figure out what the market will actually bear. Um, now, uh, places like, EG, uh, like IGN are having articles like, well, the Nintendo Switch 2, Mario Kart World, and everything around them is so expensive because they feel like they can. So in other words, like, if you look at what it would take to buy, like, some extra Joy-Cons, maybe a charging thing, get your $80 game, um, another, you know, this is looking like it could be pretty expensive, right? But the ar argument here is essentially, well, if the market will bear it, then um, why not charge more? <laughs> and again, it is true that there has been crazy levels of inflation and all of that, but hey, there you go. Now, the last interesting bit of news I'm gonna leave you guys with today is that it looks like AMD has captured nearly 80% of at least Amazon's US stats. So again, that is very different than, uh, you know, they're saying the market here, but there's a lot of market that isn't the Amazon sales US stats, but that is pretty indicative at least of people buying these on the open market. I think this would look very different if you're looking at, uh, you know, pre-built systems or uh, all sorts of other things, other retailers, whatever. But the fact that uh, March Amazon US stats show AMD CPUs uh, being nearly five times more revenue than Intel 
is certainly showing that uh, AMD gaming CPUs have really, uh, you know, there was a time where they were well behind Intel, and they've been competitive for a while now in performance, but it's looking like in sales now for, a ga uh, you know, this kind of at least individual uh, gamers buying them on, on Amazon, certainly seeming to be very dominant at this point. Now, whether or not AMD's GPUs can start to then compete with NVIDIA the same way that they did with Intel, well, that's a whole different question. I think in general, one of the hard things in the GPU space is there's so much more of a software and features side of things where AMD is trying to catch up. We're seeing things like FSR4 and all of that. Whereas in the CPU space, it's a lot more just like performance per dollar. There's much less of a features side of things, right? So if, you, if the performance is there, you've got it. Whereas uh, again, in the GPU side of things, um, uh, NVIDIA for many generations didn't really slow down on performance jumps either, but this latest 50 series slowed down a bit on performance jumps, which is kind of what happened with Intel. They, they sort of stagnated for quite a while, but NVIDIA has continued to push the software features and proprietary stuff and all of that. And so far it looks like that has worked as far as locking in sales and things like that. But what's gonna happen with this 50 series, the 90 series, what goes on in the future? It'll be really interesting to see um, you know, how people end up reacting to the market and also again, uh, how pricing ends up after this tariff situation because I'm honestly a little bit scared to think about what my future you know, best GPU to buy monthly guides are gonna look like because um, I don't know, we'll have to see how all of this settles in. Let me know what you think about all of this in the comment section. Hope you guys found the video useful and or interesting. All the sources will be linked in the video description. Huge thank you to viewers, subscribers, commenters, uh, and channel members who click the join button to directly support me financially. Huge thank you, and I hope all of you have an excellent day.